Hi everyone! Oh, I didn't get a chance to fix up my webcam. That'll do. Okay. Um, good. Good evening. Uh, I see lots of people chatting in the chat about uh, six to eight lectures and the lateness of lectures. I mean, just as a fun fact for everyone. Um, so level six courses. Uh, are basically level three, four courses that allow postgrads to do it because one third of you are postgraduate students, and the university tries to uh, to schedule postgrad lectures later. I think in general, I don't know why I have this in my hand, but um, yeah, so that's why it's kind of six to eight, and that's why courses like security and stuff are also six to eight. Beyond that, lectures can generally preference times. I never feel like I have enough time for anything, so I never really preference it, because, you know, it's kind of just like, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just there on my desk. I was trying to pull out a, my, my, my USB was broken earlier, and it got stuck in the port, so I had to, like, yank it out. Um, and here we are. Okay, so, um, hope everyone had a great week one. Um, as I said in the notice, it was really good seeing everyone get stuck into it. Um, I think one of the unique challenges of... Like, here's the, here's the thing, without getting too off-tangent. Um, I think one thing that separates a lot of computer scientists, in my opinion, from other people in other professions is their level of patience relative to other people. So. Um, I think, you know, first years are super impatient and like final years are super patient people. And I think computer scientists in general are like super more patient than others because the nature of what we do is like kind of miserable sometimes, you know, like it's not all just, oh yeah, let's like, you know, let's just like be all happy and stuff. It's like, oh, let's go look at something that doesn't work and we don't know why it doesn't work, right? Um, and it can be really challenging sometimes. So, uh, the blessing that we have is that we can most of the time fix things, you know, like nothing is worse than people who have to work with software they can't even modify a lot of the time or have solutions to solve or have any way to solve it. But what's really cool is just seeing everyone um, kind of jump in and like figure out C make lists and figure out what's happening with the assignment and try and um, <laughs> try and try and get everything working. You, you, you all think you aren't patient, but, um, you know, I think you are. I think you're pr probably more patient than you realize. Software has to instill in people a certain sense of patience. Uh, I'm sure some of you are just raving lunatics, maybe, but, you know, <laughs> probably not. Um, week two, we are here to talk about um, containers. Um, or even broader than that, we're here to talk about STL. Now, STL is a really exciting topic because it's a pretty fundamental thing to um, C++. It's also a uh, it's also a part of like your assignment, which is really cool. It's too much too much light in my room. So um, the reason that we're talking about this is because uh, most C++ programs you write will consist of data structures and algorithms, right? Like, that's what a lot of computing is. It's it's binary searches, it's sorting algorithms, it's looping algorithms, trees and uh, sets and hash maps and stuff. And some of you already dealt with those in the assignment. But um, unlike a language like C, there's a whole bunch of these software components that have been built for you and are actually baked into C++. Um, and as I said here, it's like, if you've done other courses beyond 1511, you've probably used libraries before, but libraries are a pretty pretty critical part of most programming languages. Most times you import something, you will, are using a library in some way. It's just that with a lot of other C courses you've done, you've actually been the library writer. You know, uh, 1511, 2521, if you've done those courses, you've actually had to write the graph, you've had to write the set, or you've had to write the tree, like you've had to do all of these things. Um, but we're going to be using libraries that have already been written for us um, in C++ as part of the um, standard template library. So in C++, we have this library called STL, which stands for Standard Template Library. Um, and it's basically an architecture and design philosophy for um, managing... Well, this is a very formal definition. Um, for managing abstract collections of data with... Sorry. For managing generic and abstract collections of data with algorithms. 
So what it is essentially, and this diagram below kind of ticks at it, is it's a collection of data structures. It's a collection of algorithms, right? So data structures being like trees and graphs and sets and lists and arrays. Algorithms being, you know, searching and sorting and, and, and like looping and lambdas and um, removing and inserting like the whole shebang of actually manipulating the data structures. And then those two concepts are glued together with this notion of an iterator. And iterators are um, essentially a way that containers like graphs and trees and lists and arrays provide like an API for algorithms to interact with them. And this is super exciting. This is actually something I don't think you see much in other languages. So it's one thing I think C++ does really well um, because it actually allows you to plug and play with different types of algorithms and containers as, as we will see. Um, and as you can see written in the slides here, I think the two kind of summaries of that are that containers, from a design perspective, the design philosophy of STL is such that Containers should store data, but they shouldn't have to understand how algorithms will operate on them. And algorithms should be able to manipulate data, but not have to know how containers are implemented. So it's very abstract type, like abstract data type API style thing where you're trying to develop algorithms that just focus on the like an interface and data structures that provide an interface, but that interface is broad enough and general enough that you can mix and match them, you know? So like, how can you use a search algorithm to look through a list or to look through an array or to look through a doubly linked list, like all these different structures without having to manipulate your code. So a lot of nice general behavior. Um, and we're gonna kind of step through a whole bunch of code examples on this. So the uh, first thing we're doing is, I'm gonna pull up, let me just rearrange my windows really quick. Great. I'm going to, I've got the lecture slides repo here. You can find it on, on GitLab, 6771-21T2 lectures. Um, every time a student tells me they don't know where the lecture code is, it's written up the top of the lecture page right here, just in case you missed it. So um, I did a, I'm gonna do a git pull on that make sure that I have the latest code changes and then I'm going to open it up in VS Code. Then we'll go through some examples. Let me just close up all, sorry, I was working on lectures for week three. Um, so we're going to go to the week two lectures. Now, the first example we're dealing with here is uh, vec-iter file. Now, we've talked about iteration previously um, we kind of touch on it in week two. We don't go into a lot of depth with it, but we do touch on it. Um, and what we touched on last week, though, was that for a vector, this could be a vector, but I'm using an array here just for, um, just for fun. We can loop through things in the C style with the counter and, and doing it less than the size, or we can use a full range loop, uh, which we did here when we talked about references and stuff. There's a third option, which I've slapped in the middle here, which we haven't talked about. But before we get there, let's actually talk about this data structure. So you know from last week that we could create an array in C++ of ints called ages, and we could maybe populate it with some data. Now, a vector, sorry. Now, what actually is a vector? Um, we will, I mean, we'll talk about this in a sec, but a vector is a bit different from an array. It's a, it's a dynamically sized array. And what that means is that a vector underneath the hood is an array, but it does that whole kind of re self resizing thing where if the vector gets too big, it will resize itself and get bigger and bigger and bigger like that. Um, a STD array, which is a different data structure, and you can see that instead of hash including vector, we actually hash include array. That is actually a C style array with a very lightweight abstraction in terms of it is a fixed amount of memory that you cannot exceed. And that's actually why when you're creating the array as part of the, the type parameters you're giving it, um, you actually have to give it a size because the vector is dynamically sized. So it doesn't care about, like it'll just make a decision as to how big it should be. Because underneath the hood, underneath the abstraction, it'll be, you know, it'll just set 10 elements. And then once you exceed that, it'll 
resize them and resize them and resize them. And you can actually see this if you search up standard vector at CPP reference and you go look at the uh, push back operator and you look at the time complexities of it, you can actually see this here is it says amortized constant. So amortized constant essentially just means that um, if it's set up the data structure correctly, uh, it doesn't, um, it's, it's like immediately, um, uh, <coughs> how would you put it? It doesn't need to do any reallocation, so it's constant time because adding to a data to an array is like that, right? It's direct index lookup. Um, and Jason says, uh, so why do we need an array? That's a great question, Jason. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, my my guess is that. So. These are one of those million questions I don't know the answer to. Someone in the chat might, or Nathaniel probably does on the forum. Um, two things that would come to mind. I mean, the reason you would choose an array, the reason it exists is because it would have some kind of performance benefit over a vector, right? Like it just wouldn't exist otherwise. Um, the only things I can think about are that um, I just don't know what the performance benefit is, right? So with an array, um, there might not be runtime checks. Like we could actually look this up. like. I mean, we could Google it too. I'm just not going to spend the time Googling that now. Uh, it encapsulates fixed size. Um, it might use less memory, perhaps, because it's not um, storing a count. Oh, it probably is storing a count because it's got the at. I'm not sure. Let's loop back to that one because it definitely would be storing something. But it would be something. Some of you can Google it and we can talk about it. Um, I haven't personally used it. There's you know, a third of the things in this course I've never personally used for like a, a project outside of the course. Um, I guess that's true for any course. But if we go back to VS Code, um, an array is just a fixed size. You can't you can't reallocate it, right? Like if you want a bigger array, just like in C, you actually have to make a, a new data type. Um, Neon says a vector is primitive or reference type. Um, so the way to think about variables in um, C++ is that everything's an object, just the best way to think about it. An integer is an object, or this is an object, um, and uh, yeah, when you create a type, it's an object, and a reference is a separate thing. Um, though, if, like using other language, like a vector is not in any way a primitive type. Primitive types are typically types that the uh, processor, I guess. I'm not really sure how you define it, but a primitive type is something that's not like an abstraction within the language itself. Like your CPU understands a double and it understands an int. Um, your CPU doesn't get given a vector. A vector is an abstraction that helps you manage how to interact with the CPU. But without getting too lost on that, um, we have this array here with three elements in it. And if we want to print them out, I've got three methods here. We can run. We can run this. Um, and we'll just do the same thing we've been doing previously. Build, oh god, it's so small. So, uh, someone told me how to update the config, but it appears to be... Does anyone remember the font size, not the editor? Or is it, do I want the editor to be smaller and then zoom everything in? I don't know, let's try that out. Maybe make that 16 and then we'll just make everything really big. Ah. Great. All right. Well, that's a that's a starting point. So I go to CS six seven seven one slash lectures. I'm just making the terminal smaller, and then we'll go build slash lectures slash lectures two slash demo two hundred one. There's our binary, and we run it. Now you can see this prints out stuff on um, multiple lines. I think we could probably get rid of these backslash ends uh, just so you can see things a little easier. We can run and build that one again. Ah, thank you. I'll update that later. So we run that, um, and I forgot to put the space between them. But you get the point, right? It's like we've got 18, 19, and 20, and each of these three loops will print out those three things. Now, we said we prefer the four range loop. In general, you should know that unless you're dealing with uh, iterating that requires the index. But you'll actually see this other type here, which is super interesting, which is um, uh, looping with this dot begin and dot end stuff. Now, what is actually happening here, and again, you might know this from 
Java stuff, but when you're iterating, uh, like in Java, there's a concept of an iterator. Um, and we're going to talk about iterators more in the next lecture, but essentially an iterator is an abstract pointer to somewhere in the array. So if you have some kind of data structure where you have all these like squares, like a vector or something, then what is happening when you say, I want to get the beginning of that vector is it's returning an iterator. And that iterator is basically a pointer effectively to the first element. And then just like an iterator in other languages, when you plus plus that iterator, it like a counter, then just magically moves on to the next one. And then it moves on to the next one, and then it moves on to the next one. Like that. Um, so that's actually what's happening here. And with iterators, there are two concepts. Again, we're going to loop back to this. It's just um, really simple to start. Is you have the beginning of a uh, data structure and you have the end of a data structure. And essentially this loop is saying, I'm going to create an iterator that points to the beginning. We're going to go while it's not at the end. And then we're going to increment it each time. So it'll keep moving across it. And this is actually getting into that STL topic where we're talking about iterators and we're trying to understand um, what iterators like we're trying to understand how algorithms use them. So we're not actually using an algorithm here for the data structure, right? A, an array is a container and we're using the iterator on that container, but we're not actually passing it through an algorithm. So the benefit of this is quite low here. Um, we're mainly just uh, demonstrating. Now, um, Fiasin, when asked, what is the type of dot begin? Again, the great thing about CPP reference, honestly, is that um, it's really well documented. I can go to standard array, Pretty much anything you can do in C++ is written here. I'll find my begin, and then it'll tell me um, it uh, returns an iterator type. And you could go down this rabbit hole if you want, because I know iterator would be defined here somewhere, and like an iterator is a legacy random access iterator, which is like a you know you can get lost in here. I'm not saying there's straightforward answers, but um, there are answers. Um, Uh, Gert says, why don't we have uh, auto const it? That's a good question. So why don't we have auto const it? Well, because an iterator is an actual object that you do modify. It's like a pointer. It's like a counter. It's the same reason you don't have an unsigned int const um, because you want to actually modify that thing. So we will, we will again, come back to iterators a bit more. Um, hover over auto to see the type. Hello? It's not working. Um, again, we're going to talk about iterators, so I'm not going to answer every question yet. I'm simply trying to show you that there is this concept of an iterator that we can use to loop through something, which we'll keep coming back to. So you can loop through things without index access and without four range loops. Um, you can actually do it quite directly. But don't worry, your questions will be answered, I promise. Um, there are five, I mean, there's more than this, but there are many different types of containers that we have in the course. So we're going we're gonna to look through the different types of containers, and then we'll come back to the usages of those containers. So in the set of containers, um, there are sequential containers, ordered containers, and other things like that. Um, but there's kind of five key sequential containers that are built into STL. So STL is again a set of library, it's a library, um, or I guess a set of libraries, and containers are a big part of that library, and these are the sequential containers. So sequential containers are essentially data structures that organize a finite set of objects into a strict linear arrangement. So they're ordered, and they're linearized in some way. So, well, sorry, they're not ordered, that's the wrong word. They are linear. So if you think about structures that you've dealt with, like um, uh, sets and hash maps and stuff, they're not ordered. In fact, if you've been working on the assignment, you know that there is a, a thing called an unordered set. And you know from other programming languages, if you've done like a Python course or something, that if you try and print out a dictionary, um, 
then it doesn't always print it in the same order because the dictionary itself does not order anything. So sequential containers have a sense of ordering. Now there are five key ones we're looking at here. We have a standard vector which is a dynamically sized array. So it is literally an array data structure. Um, it's just it's resized and, and let's we can look at this on CPP reference. It'll give us a tell, uh, tell what it is. The elements are stored contiguously, that means like as an array, um, which means that elements cannot can be accessed not only through iterators, but using offsets to regular pointers. Basically, it's saying it's like it's, it's a C style array underneath, um, which means really, really quick lookup. Um, the storage of a, a vector is handled automatically. It expands and it contracts as needed. And you can actually see this here because it says that um, it has this notion of a capacity. So capacity on a vector, it returns the number of elements that the container currently has allocated for. So we could actually play with this if we want to um, here. I might comment out this code quickly and, and we can just look at it together. I could say auto v equals standard vector of ints um, and it will have a one, two and a three in it. And then I could standard c out v dot size like this. Now I have to hash include vector here. I should include these alphabetically just for um, OCD reasons, I guess. Now I'm going to build that and I'm going to run it. So my code builds and I run it and it says the size is three because there are three elements in it. But if I then take this and I print out the capacity, we're going to get a different number. I think it's 10. I don't know. It's three. Okay. Maybe it's not three. Maybe it's Maybe uh, maybe the first one is like spot on. I'm not too sure. I'm not familiar with the internal workings of it. But what the capacity is, is it's the total, or maybe it's after we remove something. I think that might be it. We could go and read about this, but um, capacity is essentially the amount of uh, allocated memory that we can be queried with it, right? So um, Vectors usually occupy more space than static arrays because more memory is allocated in future to handle growth. So rather than like have four, um, and then you know it has five, and then six, and then seven, and then eight, and then nine, and like every time we do that, having to reallocate, it'll actually do it um, like in chunks. Like it'll may maybe create space for ten, and it'll wait till that ten's filled up, and then it'll double in twenty, and similarly. So I really like Fyson's suggestion about we should really push back to the array. Um, to the vector, which I agree with. Let's try that so we can understand how it works. So I'm just going to copy this line here and then I'm going to do v dot pushback. Let's add something to it. Let's just add five to it and see what happens. So what this means is that because the vector capacity is four to start, it's going to have to resize the array because it needs more space. And you can see what it's actually done here is when it's resized it, it's just doubled it because rather than resize it to five, and then again and again and again, it's just set up, we'll just double it and then done. Um, and then you can see here, let's see what happens when I um, delete from a vector. So how do I delete from a vector? Well, we go, we go and look at the, the, what do we got? What things do we have? Erase, erases elements. So this is using iterators, which I don't want to get into yet. So we probably won't be able to do much with that yet, which is fine. We can come back to that example because um, we can tie that into iterators. Um, so vector is an array that's dynamically sized. <coughs> is that pop back? Did I just miss that? Oh, I did. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, everyone. Um, I was like, I was swear there was something. I thought I was going crazy. Thought I was going crazy. Thank you so much. So let's pop back um, two elements. See what happens. I was like, I'm pretty sure you could change this. I don't think you need iterators. So there you go, it's still eight. So you can see that in this case, like, I mean, this is one, there you go. So it's, it's, not, it's not making it any smaller. I don't know what the particular algorithm is, um, but it would, in that case, it would probably be like, what's the point of downsizing that? It's eight bytes. I just don't know what it is off the top of my head. I didn't write the library. Um, so, but the point is, you can see we have this notion of a capacity. Um, and then we also have this thing reserve here, and you can go look through the library, increase the capacity. So, for instance, you've seen that it actually doubles, right? So, if I push back like five, and then I do this like a bunch of times, and then I build it and then run it, you'll see that the capacity has jumped from eight to it's now 16. 
So it's actually had to do two reallocations at this point. It's had to go from 4 to 8 to 16, like this. Whereas, if I was to instead say v.reserve, which I think you give it a size... What type does it take? A size type. Yeah, I thought it'd take a size type. So it's essentially saying, like, how many units of the type do I want? And I could just say 16. So now immediately it could get constructed with four elements. I could resize it once to 16, which is only one allocation of memory, reallocation. And now when I build it, it will be finitely faster because it's done one reallocation instead of two. So these data structures have very powerful um, APIs that you can use to modify them. Um, yeah, and Ryan says, does the compiler look ahead to see that no more is added so it doesn't bother decreasing the size? Um, no, it, it doesn't. Um, it could, though, I guess. Um, but, okay, so firstly, it probably could, theoretically. I don't think it does. Um, that's what a stand, like, that's what a compiler time optimization is. It, it looks at patterns of behavior and tries to make optimizations. The reason, though, I doubt that it would ever be implemented is because most of the variability in vector additions would probably come from user input. Like, most programs, if they're not relying on some kind of unknown input, could just be compiled to the result immediately, right? Like, if you write a program that just calculates 9 factorial, it's not, it doesn't need to compile into a program, it could just compile into a number. Um, so it's probably why it doesn't look ahead, because it's not really able to. Um, uh, Fison, will, will it throw an error if you reserve to something smaller? Probably. I mean, again, you could just look at the docs for a lot of this stuff, right? Like reserve, um, new capacity of the vector. Oh, no, it would let you do a smaller one. Um, but it says, if new cap is greater than capacity, otherwise the method does nothing. So I don't even think it would let you minimize it. I don't know. Like, I'm not going to get lost in too many rabbit holes. Um, Yeah, Charlie says, why does the capacity jump to 8 when you add something into the vector? Because it needs more space. And if it went to 5, it thinks you might add 6 soon. So why not just jump to 8? Save on a whole bunch of reallocations. Um, so that was a fun little deep dive, because I, I hope that demonstrated to you how um, these things are abstractions, right? So a vector is, a, is it an actual, you know, it has an array underneath, but th they're also lightweight abstractions. Um, for instance, uh, I'll show you another thing in C++ is that, which we will talk about later in the course again, but if I try and standard C out V0, this will give me a number, right, as you'd expect it to, because I printed out the 0th index, which gives me a 1, that's my 1 here. But if I print out, uh, and if I do V dot at 0, this does the same thing. So V dot at gives me the value at a particular index. So it's like, what's the difference between these two? Well, I'll show you the difference. Watch what happens when I try and do V of 4, which I need to remind you is the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, fifth element, right? Um, which doesn't exist. When I do this, the program will throw an error and crash. It says aborted um, because it's thrown an uncaught exception. So the actual library itself checked how many elements were in the array, in the underlying array. It found out there is no fifth element and it threw an exception. And again, the assumed knowledge in this course is that you're familiar with exceptions. But if I do something like this, v index for, I'll show you what happens. We get a massive, I think it's a heap buffer overflow. And hell, if I make this some crazy number like 400, the point is this, this, does, not, um, this does not fail gracefully in this case. Um, these are heap overflows. It's basically the equivalent of a seg fault, I think. I think because we're in debug mode, it's probably um, putting debug symbols in. Let me go to release mode and try building this again. So release mode, like think of debug mode like it builds with GDB every time and therefore it's really slow. Whereas like if I go to release mode, it, <laughs> it does something even worse. Um, it, it, it succeeds, right? And this is like a common trope of programming. If your program is, is effed, you want it to break. This is the worst thing that can happen. Your program has... This is what when we get into logic errors, right? So this program has succeeded because um, we've tried to look this up and we've somehow hit valid memory. 
So again, C++, what did we say at the start? It aims to provide lightweight abstractions. And lightweight abstraction, <laughs> lightweight abstractions um, mean getting out of your way if you don't need it. So like, um, sometimes you might not need to check the indexes right. Right? You might not need to do bounds checking because you know for some reason that it, it's valid. So C++ allows you to not do bounds checking. Right? So there's the power of it. But if you want to do bounds checking, the vector also has an at inside of it that you could use to check stuff. Um, and again, this is all written in the documentation because um, you'll see it. You'll see it here. We have our, our at. We have our operator brackets. Um, no bounds checking is performed with bounds checking. Like it's all, it's all in the docs, really good docs. Um, and yes, that's, that's undefined behavior. So, um, Saroosh says, so in C++ we don't have to write structs to define known data structures. That's correct, yes. Um, and also these are going to be written better than anything you can write, frankly, or I can write, definitely. Um, so that's why we use them. We have a standard array, which is a fixed size array. Um, someone answered before about that arrays are useful to really communicate to someone that it's a fixed size. I think that's a good point too, because it's like, if you have a, if you want to use a vector with 10 elements exactly, no more, no less, you could put comments there, but using a standard array can even communicate that clearer um, to someone. The other thing is that um, vector sizes uh, aren't known at compile time because they can be theoretically bigger and arrays are known at compile time. So the compiler will actually know how big your array is going to be. So um, forever. So there's probably some optimizations there that could be made. I'm, I'm again not sure. We have a, uh, a, a DQ, which is a double-ended queue. Um, I'm not sure how these are implemented. Uh, if they're not stored contiguously, which I think means it's not using an array, it's probably using some kind of uh, pointer of some sort, like a link list style thing. I don't know. Probably not because random access is 01. So that wouldn't make sense. I don't know how something could be a linked list with that. It just says it's not stored contiguously. So potentially it's. I just don't know. Honestly, I don't look at this one much. So I don't have a lot of good answers for you. Um, and you could read up on it again. My job here is not to read documentation for you for a couple hours. And then we have our uh, standard forward list and our standard list. So a standard list is a doubly linked list. Um, I think the reason that standard list is a doubly linked list is because doubly linked lists are really powerful um, and they're not, they don't use that much more storage. So, um, yeah, so you have a forward link list, your forward list, which is a singly linked list and you have a standard list. Yeah, I'm not sure. You guys should Google it. Like <laughs> every, every year I learn a lot more about this language and then I, there's just more and more questions and this just never, never ends. Um, just the next section in the stock. What do you mean the next section? Someone says it's really close. Did I just skip over it? Hash? I don't know. Table? Don't know. Anyway. Something. Um, Oh, typical. Ah, okay. Sorry, there we go. Typical implementation uses a sequence of individually allocated fixed size arrays. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Like, I was wondering, because, like, if it's not contiguous, but it has random access, then it has to be a collection of arrays. So, um, that's good to know. It was written right there. I just can't read. There you go. So, in terms of sequential containers, these are all the ones where things are stored linearly. I should have also, like, probably realized that, given that title. Um... And we have actually kind of looked through vector a bit. I kind of jumped ahead on this stuff, so I don't think we really need to talk about this code example because we've we've talked about at and in capacity, and we've already done for loops and stuff. But this is just essentially demonstrating what we've just been talking about with vector. Um, we have another two types of containers, which are um, so this is three types. This is the second type. Um, and it's an ordered associative container. So when something is an, is, a, is an associative container, typically it's some kind of 
hash structure. Because, um, like, not always, but, like, you want to think about it like it's like a dictionary or an, uh, an object or something where you have a key value structure, essentially. So most sequential containers are a collection of objects. Maybe those objects are pairs and tuples or structs or something, but as far as the container is concerned, it's a collection of, of single atomic objects. Um, for ordered associative containers, though, it's a... Um, typically a key pair styled structure but often it's only like the keys are the only necessary part of it so the ones you might be familiar with are sets and maps now really here even though there's four there's actually only two because we have a set which is a collection of keys which is basically keys without values so sets are how you typically just keep track of values um in an unaught in a uh, in an associative fashion, so they're not stored in arrays. It's essentially like a big pool of stuff. Um, often they'll be implemented as hashes of some sort. And then you have maps, which are key value pairs, which you've probably already figured out from the assignment is that collection of like, you know, okay, I have this key maps to that, you know, um, you know, you're collecting names and ages or names and driver's license numbers. It's how you, you associate one value to another. Um, and then you have multi-sets and multi-maps, which themselves are just uh, where you can have duplicates. Because sets and maps by default, um, which honestly I use 99% of the time, I've never had a reason to use a multi-set or multi-map. Um, sets and maps by default, you can't have duplicate keys, which is one thing that makes them really useful. So this is the multi-set um, docs, and I was hoping there might be like a handy little example here. Um, but... That doesn't really matter, but um, nope. But again, we we kind of look at these. Um, I've already got an example here anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But let's have a look at this one um, in VS Code. So, oh. so let's let's see this here. So, what I'm doing here is I'm working with a map, and because a map's an associative container. Um, that has keys linking to values, right? So A links to B. It means that the generic types that it needs are two. So we need to give it a key and a value. Um, and in this case, the, uh, the key is a string and the value is a, um, a number. And here we're saying that, um, you know, we're, we're storing, looks like names to numbers not really sure what these are for. Let's just pretend it's the weight of things, the weight of a bat or something. Um, and you can see that we're making a map, which is just um, called M. Now remember that the, the modern C++ style that we're asking you all to use is instead of doing a definition like this, we actually want you to use a definition like this. Um, and I think Nathaniel's touched on this on the forum. And our code examples just... So our lecture code examples show different ways of doing this because we want to demonstrate to you that there are different ways of doing it because lots of C++ you see around the internet will have this kind of style of things. Though we encourage you to use this approach because this essentially... It makes your code a lot more consistent because it, it basically means that every time you define, like declare and define a variable, that auto is always on the left, so it like follows a very similar pattern, which is, you know, auto variable name equals type, and then the constructor here. We'll come back to that even more next week, um, but in the meantime, just remember, anytime you see something like this where it's type variable name, it, we often want it to be auto variable name equals type. Um, so you're creating a map called M, then we're creating a pair. Now a pair, if we look that up, I don't want to Google pair because, you know, what am I going to get? Probably some fruit. Oh, that's cute. Little birdies. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, that was weird. Uh, standard pair. Um, a standard pair is essentially, think of it like a map, except, um, well, it's not really like a map. My point is that it's just a collection of two types. Now you can see that pair is defined in the utility library, but because maps are made up of pairs, like that's all a map really is, right? It's a collection of like 
key value pairs, the actual map library itself will have included pair as well. So that's why we don't need to include it here to make it um, to make it work. Uh, so we have a standard pair of this, and then we want to insert it into our map. So at this point, we create a map of M. We create a pair, which is like a little coupling of things ready to um, be slapped into a map. And then we insert it into the map. You can also insert things directly into the map like this. Now, this, this doesn't really fit into a language convention because it doesn't really make sense. Like, what the hell is that? Like, it's braces and a comma. Okay. But um, the compiler is actually, will actually automatically take that and it will turn it into a standard pair and then it will insert it for you. So this is kind of like a shortcut way to do the above. Um, uh, but the preferred way of doing it, because it's a lot clearer in my opinion, is to actually use the in place, um, uh, in place function. So if you go to the standard maps uh, API, you'll see that they have a whole bunch of uh, modifiers, which will include insert, which you'll see here will say inserts elements since C++17, and then you have in place, um, which constructs elements in place. So I'll also tell you why this one's better. Um, the reason I like this one is because I think it's I think it's a bit clearer. Oh, my microphone just came out. Oh, one sec. Okay, I got it in. Jesus. There we go. Um, I like this one because it's kind of clear that it's like just it's a it's a function call that takes in two arguments as opposed to a function call that takes in a squiggly little collection of things. Um, but I think the other reason this is preferred is because what this one actually does is that it, um, and bear with me here because I, I, I haven't double checked this, triple checked it, sorry. But what insert does is I think insert takes the value and then copies it sometimes. And if, if, if this is not true, I mean, this is not a big detail, but this is an example of something that actually happens a lot in C++, um, is that I think it might copy it, whereas in place will actually construct it inside. So it's constructed in place. And I think what that means is that um, insert will, like doing this via insert, you have to take the two variables, construct it into a pair, and then copy that pair in and have it recreated in the structure, right? So there's that extra step of like taking values, constructing a pair, copying that pair in, um, whereas an in place will actually just take the two values and construct it straight into the into the data structure. Um, and in that way, it I think it has a finite um, improvement on time, like as in it's 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 a little bit faster. So. Um, you can see here that uh, someone is also trying to print out the value at a given key, right? Because maps are just key value pairs. Um, we have written here, this is very dangerous and one of the most common causes of mistakes in C++. Uh, yeah, so generally, I've got all these tabs open here, I'm sorry, probably all over the place. But um, generally speaking, if you're trying to look up the value of something in a, in a map, um, you want to use uh, the lookup to find it. Um, now, in next lecture, I think is when we talk about how to look things up in these structures using iterators. But generally speaking, you would rather use the find method rather than trying to look things up directly. Or you use dot at in this case as well, um, just like a just like a vector has. Um, so just to answer a couple of questions that have come up on this example, uh, Matthew says, when declaring a container without contents, is there a difference between braces and brackets? So the short answer is no. Um, longer answer is a little bit, but we're talking about that in week three, but for now the answer is just like an easy no. Um, easy, easy no. Um, and yep, Charlie says, is it accurate to say that a map is an array of pairs? Um, and someone's already answered that because it's not really an array. Um, it's, these things are often stored as hashes or something like that. Um, which means that they're they're not contiguous in memory. Like that's the thing about an array. It's uh, 
it's it's they're all it's all a block of memory together. Um, so that's ordered associative arrays. Now the keys are actually sorted here. Um, I don't quite know off the top of my head how they're sorted, um, <clears throat> but they are certainly sorted. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> they're sorted in the sense that <clears throat> when you print these out, like in this code example here, they will print out of, in, a, in an actual order um, that is predictable. And like we can try this here, for instance. Like if I, maybe if I try and insert like bat and cat and dat, I think, let me try this. Sorry, my throat's just gone. That's the wrong code example. Yeah, so <clears throat> you can see here that the, ac the actual um, keys themselves are ordered. So when I try and print it out, it printed out bat cat dat, even though I added bat dat cat. <laughs> And that's why you use a map if you if you care about the keys being ordered. So if you don't care about the keys being ordered, you use the next type of data structures. But if you do care about them being ordered, then um, the map structure will, will be very efficient. Um, but yes, this is dangerous uh, just just for the same reason it is with a vector. It's 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 a, a no bounds check lookup. Um, you you're basically you're basically just saying like. You know, I am so certain it's there that I'm going to ask no one to check it. And if I get it wrong, we get into the undefined behavior territory. And undefined behavior is really dangerous because anything can happen. Undefined behavior can make your program work a hundred times and then fail the hundred and first time, um, which makes it super dangerous. Okay. Um, everyone have a good time? Everyone, everyone good? Everyone good? Happy? Chilling? 119 people watching. It's good. It's about a quarter of you. Okie dokie. Um, the last type is unordered associative containers. So there's not a lot of explanation that's needed here because um, unordered sets, unordered maps are like sets and maps. They just don't have a sense of order. That means you can't just say to it, like if you say to it, give me all the keys. It might be able to give you a list of keys. You might be able to iterate over it in certain libraries, but it's not ordered. Um, and if you do get an order, it's just because that's how hap it happened to um, uh, be printed out to you, right? So there's no real order. It might just appear to be an order. Now, there might be the question, why do we want to use these if there's no order? And the answer is because they are very, very fast. And I know this because these uh, libraries were introduced in C++11 and the two years I spent writing code for RoboCup, one of those years was a lot of C++, um, there sure was no... we were using C++98 on the robots at the time, so we couldn't even use these. So we actually had to use C style... we had to like write C style hash maps essentially because if you go and look at our um, s maps, right? Here's the thing about maps. When you want to get a a value, so for instance, find, or you want to find something, um, it's logarithmic. Now, I, I don't have the headspace right now to remember why that's logarithmic. It probably implies that it's stored as a tree. It's probably as a tree. That would make sense if it's an ordered set. Um, so I'm going to just guess it's a tree. But... Um, it's logarithmic, which means that it has to go through the entire structure, right? And like go down through the tree to be like, oh, there it is. Um, so it's actually probably not um, <coughs> using hashes to store this here, right? It's just going to be using it as a tree. Um, and that means that lookup is log n. Now log n is still very quick, right? Log n is like for a balanced tree, a million items is only 20, 20 levels to go down. So, you know, massive, Im massive improvements at scale. Um, but it's not instant. <clears throat> so if you're dealing with huge, huge quantities or unbalanced trees and everything like this, then it's not that slow. Um, not that quick. Sorry. Now, where an unordered set differs, 
is that an unordered set or an unordered map, an unordered map's super powerful, is that I'm pretty sure it's it's definitely a hash structure where essentially um, you take, like, what happens is you hash the key and then that hash tells you where to find the value and there's sometimes collisions in that, but generally not, which means that when someone gives you a key, you can tell if it's in the map immediately by hashing it, which is generally considered a constant time operation, and then it tells you immediately. So there's no traversing, there's no traversing arrays, there's no traversing trees, it's just traversing, it's just looking up the hash directly. Um, because we're using hashes, there's no sense of order. You can't, you can't really store a hash style structure with a sense of order without adding more overhead. And again, the point of C++ is to provide lightweight abstraction. So unordered maps, unordered sets, perfect things if you're trying to look up really quick because it's constant time lookup. Um, uh, yeah. Someone has said, isn't it crazy that um, it took C++20 to include a dot .contains method? That's true. Let's see what the difference is. Because I look at this, I haven't used dot .contains, but it's like at will actually get you the value. Returns a reference to the mapped value. So you give it a key, and if the value is there, it um, uh, returns you a reference to that value. And you can see if it's not there, it actually throws a standard out of range exception. We talk about exceptions in week four. Um, but since C++20, they've added a new method, which is um, contains, which returns a bool. So basically, uh, someone like, you can imagine how annoying it would be to use an unordered map. And like, if you want to figure out if something's in there, you have to do like a try catch, see if an exception's thrown, um, which is just like a pain, right? It's just more code, potentially more confusion as opposed to a nice little like dot contains method. Um, you'd want find not at. Uh, I actually don't know what the difference is between, con oh, okay, so, I don't know what the difference between contains and find is, because find, I guess, would give you the element. Oh, yeah, so find would give you the element, I guess. Contains would just tell you if it's there. That's an easy answer. Um, so if you actually need the value of it, then you would probably use at. I think returns the element, it'll tell us at returns t ampersand. So to read these docs as well, standard unordered map, um, it actually has all this other crap here, but you can ignore that. It's basically like you create an unordered map, it has a key and it has a value, that's what t is. So this is saying that the at function in the map returns you a reference to t, a value. Um, so at and find are kind of the same thing. One's an iterator, one's just the reference, but um, yeah, generally contains is just different to that. Okay, um, spending a lot of time on the docs today, which I think is kind of fun, because um, you know we get to learn a little bit about how to interpret things, which I think is super useful. So, uh, yep, these uh, these unordered structures are ridiculously fast for lookup, fast retrieval. That's what they're for. Okay, and last thing before we take a break and then we start talking about iterators is container performance. So, now we've been talking about these. Um, as we go through them, but the point is that um, just like you would have learned in data structures and algorithms, every container has compromises on performance and choosing the right container all depends on what you're doing. Generally speaking, um, you can get very, very, very far with vectors and unordered maps. Like you could do, I'd say, 90% of things you want to with just that because one of them is a contiguous data structure with instant like um, look up and addition and it's ordered and then maps are like real, like, um, you know, fast retrieval and stuff like that. But it's important that you remember that all of them do have different um, structures. So for instance, like if you look at a list here, which you know is a doubly linked list, look at all of its erase, insert, pop back, push back, pop front, all of these things, which are the, the modifications, they're all hugely fast. Whereas, you know, getting the size of it, um, equality here, probably even some lookups as well, which isn't referenced here. They're quite slow, right? That's the nature of linked list. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the big difference. Um, and the other thing, just last reminder, I guess, is that 
a lot of data structures will do amortization stuff too. Um, like that's why you'll see things like amortized, uh, like what did, what did the, like anytime you see a data structure, say, where's me vector? Oh, we got to go up one containers library vector. Ah. Uh, yeah, I'm surprised the list doesn't store the size as well. Let's actually look at the list. Did the list have a, uh, did the list have a plus? No, it didn't. That's okay. Um, yeah, so like lists, if you want to get the size of the list, it'll tell you the complexity is um, now constant. So I think this table is probably outdated now even. A constant or linear. So yeah, since C++11, it's constant. To be honest with you, this is actually one of the oldest screenshots of the... This is So this course was originally created on another slide deck that I copied from the version of the course that I did as an undergrad a long, long time ago, and we threw out most of it, but this is one thing we kept because I thought it was a cool table. But as you can see, this is actually, this table was actually uh, when C++11 was released, so it's probably referring to like just before then. So that's another example of why newer C++ features um, are better. Um, I was a bit dubious of that because I had the same question you did, uh, Biasin, when I was like, oh, that seems a bit weird that it wouldn't be constant time. But yeah, again, if you look at things like pushback, you'll see this phrase amortize constant, which again, just kind of means that, so amortization, amortized analysis or amortization analysis, I can't remember, is basically just trying to look at the complexity of something over a, a broad thing, which, which um, ignores like these little one-offs. So it's like if you try and add a million numbers, right, to a, to a vector, it's going to resize it 20 times. So when you look at that, you want to take, you know, instead of like when you have an ins when you have eight items and you insert one, you wouldn't want to look at the complexity of that because that would be a reallocation plus an insertion. You'd want to look at like, okay, well, a million items, 20 reallocations in the context of a million items is kind of, we like amortize that out. So it's like, you know, these, these like preemptive and structural changes are just like, we just kind of ignore them, but we note that it's like, it's constant time if you amortize out the the bigger things that happen. Um, anyway, let's take a five or so minute break. We'll get started around 7, 10. Um, but before we do, because we've just finished this one, I would also like to take the opportunity to uh, ask you all to fill out the survey for um, this lecture. So this is STL containers. Um, I'll probably start putting these in the slides instead, because otherwise I'm going to forget. So grab your phone, recording, live stream, snap it quick. Be like, yep, give it a number. I don't care about the feedback. I mean, the feedback matters to me, I guess, if you have something to say, but like the biggest one's just the number because what, what I typically will do is like at the end of the course, I'll go through all, like I'll find like the top 15, top 10, whatever worst lectures, and then I'll figure out what was wrong with them. So anyway, um, <clears throat> cool. Well, yeah, thanks for filling that out. And um, let's take a break and I'll get back to it after the break. <laughs> 